six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have lift off at two thirteen. Clear the tower. Prepare yourself for a world of science. What is going on, everybody? Conley here with the Science Nights in the morning. We are absent one night. Dr. Anurban Bhattacharjee doing some uh, very important things over there in the uh, India world, right? In, uh, in the world of India. Uh, but we have a very special guest today, Dr. Sean Graham's here in the house, uh, Dr. Thomas Schiller, a local paleontologist, going to have a lot of fun with this episode today. And all the way from Australia, we have uh, Stephen Parapat. Stephen, how's it going? Hey. hey there, I'm really well. How are you? <laughs> we are doing great. We are doing excellent. What's going on real quick before we uh, get into our topic? What's going on over there in Australia? How are you all doing with uh, all this stuff that's going out? Oh, look, as you probably would have heard, you know, we're um, still kind of under lockdown because of coronavirus. Um, and otherwise, just trying to endure a bit of what, what for us at least is cold weather. It's about 14 degrees today. Uh, it was centigrade. So, uh, yeah, that, that for us is cold. I'm in, a, I'm in gloves and a beanie. So. Uh, whoa. <laughs> yeah. It was in the mid-90s today here in Texas. So. Yeah. I mean, it was it actually pretty 90 like, degrees beautiful. centigrade. No, it was yeah. incredible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, wow. And you're down in Melbourne, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Southeastern that's, Australia. That's pretty far south, so it would be pretty cold in the wintertime mm -hmm. there. Wow. Yeah. You said you're, uh, normally you're... this you know Normally this time of year, I'd be up in central Queensland, so way further north, and I'd be digging up dinosaurs. But, of course, you know, All coronavirus right. has canceled our dig this year. So. Oh, no. That's a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of digging up dinosaurs, uh, today's episode is going to be all about a new discovery. Uh, and you're kind of uh, around this, right? Like you are very yeah. much part of this new uh, important discovery. And I'll let uh, Dr. Sean Graham and Dr. Thomas Schiller, I'm sure they have a ton of questions for you. And I'm going to kind of be listening on myself and learning as much as I can. Yeah. So um, <laughs> why, don't, why don't we begin with your background? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're interested in, and, and what you've studied in the past? Because I, I kind of read through your CV, and, and I learned that you started with ostracods. Is that correct? I did, yeah. So my, my PhD was um, very much sort of with a hydrocarbon focus, so targeting uh, oil deposits in, in Brazilian offshore basins. Um, and as a result of my PhD, I actually visited Texas in uh, about 2008 um, to you know, attend something at Shell, at Shell Brazil there in Houston. Um, but soon after starting that sort of work and doing the PhD in it, I decided I really didn't want to go down the hydrocarbon track. You decided um, you I, decided you didn't I, want to make money, but you'd rather find dinosaurs. I'd, I'd rather, exactly. I'd rather yep. enjoy life and study <laughs> dinosaurs, study something I'm really interested in, not completely destroy the environment, that sort of thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, so I'd, I'd always had an interest since I was a kid um, in dinosaurs and wanted to have the opportunity to study them. And thankfully, shortly after my PhD, uh, a colleague in my department, who's actually one of my co-authors on this recent paper we're discussing today, Patricia Vickers-Rich, helped me get a job over in Sweden. And um, bizarrely enough, that is what led me to start studying Australian dinosaurs really seriously because my funding over there through my old boss, Ben Keir, um, was focused on Australian sauropods. And um, so most of my work has been on them. But of course, you know, I've gone into many other groups of dinosaurs as well and worked on specimens from other countries too. Wow, that's a pretty big leap from the from tiny little things to the biggest things that ever walked around on Earth. That's very that's cool. It, yeah, so it's sort of a strange thing. Yeah, but, you know, I was going to go down a track where I was going to use a microscope day in day out, looking at you know little beans that are only a millimeter long, to wow. looking at dinosaurs that have thigh bones that are sometimes more than two meters long. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. I have to interrupt real quick and ask, uh, what did you think of Texas? Were we all on horses and, uh, you know, had the spurs going and, and you know, cowboy hats and roping, roping people you in the said, middle you, of the street? You said you came into Houston, right? Oh, yep. um, okay. That's not, well, yeah, I, no, no cowboys I, there. No. 
Yeah, no, I didn't get much of the sort of true Texas experience. I mean, we were dying in fine French restaurants and all this ridiculousness. Um, one of my other friends from <laughs> my department, though, did tell me that the one time he went to Texas and he must have flown in somewhere else other than Houston, as he was landing, he sees this person, yeah, full stereotypical Texan cowboy just, you know, riding around. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Wish I'd had that experience. <laughs> Instead, I was seeing I was seeing trams. It was like being back here in Melbourne. So, wow. Well, you can you can come out here to West Texas anytime. We'll take you out and dig up some dinosaur bones. Oh, yeah, and you'll see people so on horses. Yeah, too. you'll actually see some real Texans out here. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be terrific. All right. Well, let's uh let's get to it then. So this this recent paper is over a really kind of. I don't want to say enigmatic group of dinosaurs, but um, when people think of theropod dinosaurs, they don't automatically go to laphrosaurs. Um, Mm -hmm. But can you tell us a little bit about this group of dinosaurs just in general and why this this new discovery is so important? Yeah, so uh, a laphrosaurs, um, they're they're a type of theropod called a ceratosaur. So uh, I guess the, the most famous and the first scientifically recognized ceratosaur was ceratosaurus itself from the Morrison Formation, Jurassic of North America. Um, but ever since, um, especially the, the 1980s, we've gotten a much better understanding of ceratosaurs as a whole. We now know that there were a group called abelosaurs, which did really well in South America, but also lived in Africa and, and Europe. And um, the abelosaurs, uh, they have sort of three main subgroups. The abelosaurids, which are the big ones with very short arms like Carnotaurus and Majungasaurus. Uh, you have the noosaurids, um, which are then divided into two groups, the noosaurines, which are the close relatives of the laphrosaurs, and the laphrosaurs themselves. Um, so the, you know, our understanding of them has only really improved in the last 10 years, I would say, thanks to a lot of fossil discoveries in, in Madagascar and elsewhere. Um, but laphrosaurs themselves are sort of aberrations among the noosaurs. They, um, they show some typical noosaur features or ceratosaur features, which is to have four-fingered hands and very short arms. Um, but unlike the other uh, Sabatosaurs, they've got very, really long necks, and it, as adults at least, they lost all their teeth and replaced uh, the sort of outer covering of their mouth with a, a horny beak, as many other unrelated uh, theropods did, like Ornithomimosaurs and Oviraptorosaurs. Uh, but yeah, Laphrosaurs, uniquely among Sabatosaurs, did that. Um, otherwise, in some ways, you know, you see them in a lineup of other theropods, especially, you know, Scylosaurs, and you go, well, they don't really look that different. They've just got the short, stumpy arms that, that distinguish them from other theropods, really. And you, you just mentioned um, this. Th- I find it interesting, the replacement of the, uh, the teeth with a beak, and that's happened, uh, looking at the phylogeny, it looks like that happened mm-hmm. more than once within theropods. Happened, yeah, definitely. Um, sorry, you were going to continue. Yeah, and, and so... It, and I'm a little bit familiar with some of the ones like the ornithomimids. Are they mostly northern hemisphere in distribution? So could this be so, some sort of a weird kind of Gondwanan, uh, you know, uh, a convergence where the ones in the southern hemisphere did it independently from the ones in the northern hemisphere? Or are they all just kind of mixed together throughout the world and it happened some other way? Um, well, based on when um, alaphrosaurs were around, um, so our best records of them are from the Jurassic, from uh, Eastern Africa and from China, it's entirely possible that this was a group that was globally distributed, at mm-hmm. least by the end of the Jurassic. And maybe it's just that we haven't found their fossils and so, you know, they're underrepresented in, in a lot of our um, our understanding of study of, of faunas from you know, across the world. Um, but I think that, yes, it's certainly, you would put it down to convergence and maybe it's ultimately the extinction of the laphrosaurs that might have allowed a lot of coelurosaurs to take on a similar niche and to lose their teeth, replace it with a beak and start exploiting different food sources to other more typically pred- predatory theropod dinosaurs. Um, I guess, you know, uh, now that we have a laphrosaurs in the Cretaceous in both South America and, um, and Australia, we know that they persisted at least that long down here. Um, the earliest records of, of toothless of Raptorosaurs and Ornithomimosaurs, as far as I'm aware, is late Cretaceous. So there's maybe not so much overlap in time mm. between those ones, and they could have independently come to it to exploit the same sort of food source. So the, these guys were pretty long-lived, right? I mean, you're talking Jurassic to at least early Cretaceous? Yeah, so Limusaurus from China is about 160 million years old, whereas um, our one 
from Victoria is about 110 to 107 million years old, and then Huancosaurus from uh, Argentina is about 95 million years old. So they're around for a good 70 to 80 million year chunk of the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous and even into the late Cretaceous. So... Um the the fact that these are are such a long lived group of dinosaurs is one of the interesting things about them. But what's specifically interesting about this one from Australia? Um, well, until Huancosaurus was described earlier this year, um, ours would have been the very first evidence of survival of Elaphrosaurs into the Cretaceous. Um, with Huancosaurus, we have a total of two specimens that indicate that. So that is, you know, the, the fact they were in Australia is one significant thing. We'd never had any evidence of them before. But the other thing is that, yeah, we can now say pretty clearly and concretely that they survived well beyond the late Jurassic when they were basically thought to be extinct because there were no fossils after that point in time. Um, and of course, that has ramifications for... I mean, well, the other thing, I guess, that our fossil tells us um, is that Elaphrosaurs were capable of tolerating polar climates back in the back in the Cretaceous period. Of course, it was nowhere near as cold globally as it is now. Um, but that means, you know, the, the fact ours was living at about 76 degrees south, it was almost within or just within the Antarctic Circle. And so it was dealing at least with periods of darkness uh, every single year. And um, that means that almost certainly, if we find the right aged rocks in um, in Antarctica, we'll find elaphrosaurs down there as well. Maybe they were pushed towards the poles as the Cretaceous wore on and as other groups of theropods arose, especially coelurosaurs coming to dominance. Yeah, that's a really cool part of the story. And I would love for you to maybe try to use your imagination a little bit. And to, what would that world be like that you hear about polar dinosaurs? But, and, and it's so hard, I think, for people to wrap their minds around because I think that their first gut tells them, you know, they're picturing dinosaurs on a glacier running around. And mm-hmm. it's not quite that, but it's even it's even weirder. So describe the environment that this, this critter lived in. Yeah, so um, our Victorian dinosaur deposits in, you know, so the ones that represent these these polar faunas, um, they are typically riverine sediments. So massive sedimentary deposits that are deposited by quite deep and quite broad rivers. And these rivers occupied a rift valley that was situated between Victoria and modern day Tasmania. Nowadays it's Bass Strait and it's and it's ocean for all intents and purposes, but back then it was much narrower. Um, and despite the fact that we were at about 76 degrees south around 110 million years ago, it would not have been, you know, there wouldn't have been permafrost at that time. There wouldn't have been probably much snow except at high altitudes or much ice. Um, these rift valleys instead were subjected to repeated earthquakes um, because of the, the continual separation of Victoria and Tasmania. But the climate was sufficiently warm that it was dense forest where it wasn't you know, actively flowing rivers. So the, the, the flora at the time is extremely diverse. Uh, we have the sort of mainstays of the Mesozoic, things like conifers, relatives of modern day monkey puzzle trees and, and pines. Um, but then angiosperms, flowering plants, were coming into real dominance. So they were becoming way more abundant, way more diverse. Uh, and we find their fossils you know, fairly regularly in the right deposits uh, in Victoria. But otherwise, of course, there are other mainstays of the Mesozoic as well. We have ferns, we have cycads, we have an extinct group called Benetotales. Uh, and then there are two groups that are still alive in various parts of the Northern Hemisphere today, horsetails, which I understand are much more you know, widespread than ginkgos, which are just in China natively now. Uh, but they were present in Victoria at that time as well. So we had this incredibly diverse flora, despite the fact that it was 76 degrees south and, and you know, basically within the Antarctic Circle. So these dinosaurs would have in some ways been experiencing the kind of environmental conditions we'd associate with the kind of latitude that Melbourne's at now, maybe 40 or 50 degrees, no, nowhere near as far south as we'd expect mm-hmm. that sort of environment today. Yeah, Sean ruined ruined my pun that I had lined up about the land down under. <laughs> I'm really I'm really steamed about that, Sean. <laughs> what did I do? I was going to say the land down under, but further down under <laughs> oh, back then. God. Yeah, it was going to be great. Well, there, you said it anyway. You <laughs> yeah. said it anyway. It's not, it's not funny anymore, though. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and there would have been seasonal darkness, right? Um, despite the fact it, there would have been times of the year, even though it was warm, when, uh, you know, there would have been, you know, eight-hour days. And these, mm-hmm. these critters were having to tolerate that. 
Um, what yeah, I- and, and of course, if they were, you know, they, they might have been migratory to some degree. Mm. Of course, they couldn't fly, so you know, they would have to have relied on their own leg power to get them out of Victoria and move further north to, with the light. Um, but they, you know, because they're just within the Antarctic Circle, it's possible that they were, you know, only coming that far south. In, in summer when there was going to be more abundant plant life, uh, more abundant animals tackling that plant life, you know, small small reptiles, small mammals that they could attack um, even with their toothless beaks. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's likely that they would have exploited whatever conditions were favourable to them. Uh, we do have some very tentative evidence of dinosaur burrows in Victoria. Um, they've been attributed to ornithopods mainly because that's the only group that we know burrowed for sure, based on Erectodromaeus from uh, from North America. Um, but of course, it's possible that laphrosaurs use their back legs, like modern day mound building birds, to to dig as well. Wow, I haven't I haven't heard about that. That's pretty interesting. That's really cool. Imagine some some like six foot wide dinosaur yeah. burrows. That's pretty cool. A little prairie dog mm. colony. Yeah. Dinosaurs. And so what other um, what other vertebrates were in the neighborhood at the time? Do you have evidence of uh, other fossils from the same site? You can paint the picture a little bit. Yeah, we do. So um, obviously this site being, being a river system, we find abundant evidence of the animals that were actually living in those rivers. And so stock standard uh, bony fish, actinopterygians, and also we find lungfish tooth plates uh, because they were doing really well Australia-wide during the Cretaceous. Um, in some sites, like uh, Dinosaur Cove, which is around Cape Otway from where this new dinosaur, the Neolaphrosaurian, came from, we find evidence of crocodiles in the in the fauna. Um, but strangely, at Eric the Red West, where the Elaphrosaur came from, we actually find evidence of freshwater plesiosaurs uh, in, in the form of their teeth. And if we go further around Cape Otway still, we find their ribs as well. So they were almost certainly, you know, we typically associate plesiosaurs with marine habitats. These ones were swimming up these big rivers and probably attacking whatever they could uh, fish-wise in those systems. Um, but of course, the other thing that we get in these river systems is evidence of terrestrial animals like our Elaphrosaur. And um, Overwhelmingly, we would find ornithopods among the dinosaurs. Uh, so there's one species that's been named from the Eric the Red West site called Diluvi cursor picaringi. That was named early in early 2018. Um, but based on research that my honours student from last year, Ruri Duncan, was doing, we almost certainly have at least three species of ornithopod at the site, and they include ones that we know from elsewhere in Victoria. So one's called Atlas Copcosaurus lodzi, uh, and the other one's called Leolinosaurus amicographica, and we seem to have evidence of both of those at this site as well. Um, so that's that's kind of cool, just to note that there's at least three types of ornithopod living alongside one another. Um, but otherwise, we get a, an abundance of turtle remains. So these freshwater turtles were loving these riverside settings. And then we get the predatory dinosaur in our environment as well, and that is a megaraptorid theropod. So um, you might be familiar with megaraptor itself or maybe even the Australian Australovenator. These are predatory dinosaurs that, you know, for all intents and purposes, we're using their hands and their arms as their main weapons. They have very small, unspecialized teeth. They have unspecialized hind limbs. But on their hands, or their, their really muscular arms, they have three clawed fingers. Uh, and the first two claws, you know, the thumb and the, and the pointer finger, have absolutely massive claws on them. So they were obviously their primary weapons. And, you know, it's quite likely they were tackling these ornithopods and maybe even the Victorian elaphrosaurine as their prey item. Yeah, so their techniques were a little bit different from our big North American Cretaceous theropods. Yeah, exactly. Like you know, T. Rex is a head-first predator, right? and then its relatives are as well. Whereas things like the Dromaeosaurs, like Deinonychus, uh, they're, they're feet first and, and probably using their hands as well. But Megaraptorids were using mainly their hands as their as their prey acquisition devices. Very cool. Well, I'm I'm really interested in the kind of the paleobiology about this animal. So we've got about one more minute before the break. Um, we'll probably save that for after the break, though, because um, that's that's a pretty broad topic. But um, is there any uh, fossil evidence of um, boxing gloves? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, not for Elaphrosaurs, but maybe for the Megaraptors. You know, if they want to have a, a non, non-lethal non fight. <laughs> yeah, just wanted to play a little bit. Yeah. Well, this has been really great, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, you're giving us a, a... I think you're giving our audience a really good picture of how diverse these other fossil sites oh, yeah. are like. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. So we're going to keep on this topic. We'll be right back after the break. Stick around. Science Nights in the Morning. Hey everybody, Sean Graham here, Science Nights in the Morning, and we are back, and we are still talking about this spectacular new discovery of a new Australian dinosaur, and one of the really cool things about this story is not, you know, all about the dinosaur itself, but I I feel like the story of how it was discovered is kind of a good illustration of how paleontology works sometimes, and I also want to point out that this is huge news, and and congratulations to you, Stephen, because you were on, I found out about this from the guardian which is pretty big paper and this other thing i've if you guys ever heard it's bbc i'm not sure what that stands for but that's like a local deal i think it's like it must be yeah it's like birmingham alabama broadcasting (laughs) company or something like that so it's it's everywhere you're getting a lot of publicity and and that's awesome now you're on the science nights he's reached the peak so you are exploding (laughs) so steven could you describe such a good feeling Could you tell us uh, the story about how this, and it's just a single fossil, right? A single vertebra. Yep. So, um, yeah, it, it was collected by a, um, a group called Dinosaur Dreaming. They are a volunteer organization, and they have been helping with dinosaur digs on the Victorian coast here in Australia for about 30 years now. Uh, so it is a bunch of, it's literally almost a, a bunch of people who are just interested in paleontology. Very few of them are professionals. And um, they are often you know, lots of students and, and lots of um, retirees, but just people who are passionate about this stuff. Without them, we would not get through anywhere near as much rock in any dig season as we do because we're dealing with really, really hard sediments, really hard sandstones and siltstones. And they are sitting there on the beach breaking rock into fairly small pieces so that they don't miss any of the fossils that are held within. It's the typical way we operate. In this case, a volunteer named Jessica Parker uh, just happened to graze the edge of a bone when she was breaking rock. And she identified the bone in the field, went, okay, we've got to stop progressing the breakage of this rock here. And um, took it to the supervisor and the supervisor said, yep, you found a bone. That's great. Let's let's keep it aside. It was taken back to the lab at Melbourne Museum where David Pickering, uh, the, who was the collections manager at the time in vertebrate paleontology, decided that it was a priority and started to prepare the specimen. And he realized that Jessica had just nicked the edge of the bone. More often than not, our volunteers will break a bone straight in half because the rock's so hard and the bone's so soft. Uh, But in this case, she just nicked it. It's a good thing she did because the bone was super delicate. And when Dave uncovered it, extracted all the rock from around the bone, he realized it was something really significant and something we'd never really seen before. Uh, But the thing was that he didn't recognize it as a theropod dinosaur. He thought it was from a pterosaur. Uh, so a type of pterosaur called a tapi harid. And um, it would have been a group we'd never seen in Australia before, but he wasn't quite right, as we later found out. Yeah, that's that's kind of the first thing I thought when I saw the photo of the of the vertebra. It looks just like a weird, long pterosaur vert, you know? Yeah, and I know in Texas you guys have got Quetzalcoatlus. Well, yeah, yeah, so it's a yeah. relative of tapi harids as an azadarchid. Um, and they've got super elongate neck vertebrae that look superficially very similar to this one um so in this case that's what dave thought he had um and as a result i you know, i'm not a pterosaur specialist i um had sort of left it on the back burner for a few years in my mind wasn't sure i'd ever get to work on it but then in 2017 um a wonderful pterosaur fossil was found up in winton by a local grazier and um a phd student adele pentland was and one of my co-authors on the elaphrosaur study was Put onto this pterosaur and i was asked to supervise her and as a result i thought oh look it'd be great if she had a look at this vertebra as well and um so she did and eventually she went oh, look, this is not a pterosaur it's it's something else and together we worked out that it was a theropod and then you know because of we knew it was a theropod we we're like oh, okay what sort of theropods have long necks uh and the first step was ornithomimosaurs um, and it's a really good match for Gallimimus uh, and, and Struthiomimus um, in terms of just the overall structure. But you look at the specifics of the, inf- of, of the vertebra and it doesn't match in detail. So then we thought, well, what other groups can we look at? And started flicking through and went, ah, 
it's an elaphrosaur, but it's an elaphrosaur way out of time relative to the rest of the group. Mm. So it was um, it was a, an amazing day when we worked out first of all that it wasn't a pterosaur, and then that it wasn't an elaphrosaur. But it took about nine nine months to get the paper finished from that point. Yeah, I like that part that where the kind of narrative shifts, where you're like, okay, it's not a pterosaur what could it be and then you're digging in mm. the stacks you're looking at, at the books and things had you ever even heard of an laphrosaur before you started looking i i had and um, it was in some ways i think it was probably the fact that i was a dinosaur nut when i was a kid that that really helped because um you know in the modern day um it's been pretty well established since the 1990s that a laphrosaurus itself is a ceratosaur not um you know not anything else but when i was a kid i remember reading probably books that were even out of date for their time that said that Elaphrosaurus was an ornithomimosaur. And it's just because it is so convergent with ornithomimosaurs in terms of its shape that it was ever thought to be that way. The problem with Elaphrosaurus has always been that the only skeleton that we know of that animal has no head uh, and it doesn't have its hands either. It's mostly complete otherwise, but it's missing those critical pieces. And so it was always going to be difficult to work out what it was until more complete specimens came to light or until you know we filled in the theropod family tree a bit more densely. Um, and so Limusaurus being reported in 2009, I think it was 2005, um, that changed the game because that's known from you know a dozen complete specimens that range from juveniles to adults um, and they they tell us all sorts of things we had no idea about with respect to elaphrosaurs um, one of the most important being that as as juveniles they had teeth but as, as adults they didn't so so what do you or what's the the most common kind of hypothesis about why they had this beak-like structure and and why they had a long neck like this because it's pretty bizarre it is really bizarre um I guess what seems to happen with um, with theropods when they develop beaks um, and when they develop uh, long necks, it almost always associated with a shift towards herbivory. Um, so theropods typically predatory dinosaurs, but when they develop those long necks and beaks, yeah, that they're, they're shifting away from a meat-based diet. So um, it's almost certain, I guess, that um, Limusaurus as a youngster was probably you know, targeting small animals by and large. Um, but then as an adult, if it needed to target those small animals, obviously if they're burrowing, it might need to reach down burrows with that long neck, but that's not really going to be enough to sustain it anymore. And so having a mixed diet or having a primarily plant-based diet might have been the way to, to I guess, combat that. Um, ornithomimosaurs, as far as we know, were beaked you know, from you know, juvenile, sh well, yeah, from the juvenile stages right through adulthood. Uh, so, you know, elaphrosaurs don't seem to have done a com as complete a transition. Um, but yeah, I would say it's almost certainly associated with reaching plants um, and processing them that would have caused these animals to get their long necks and their toothless beaks. Is there any kind of direct evidence for that? Any any sort of uh, stomach contents or or any dino? Dino poop related to these animals. <laughs> or any copper lights? Oh, that'd be that'd be nice. So I I don't think any of the specimens of elaphrosaurs we have so far preserve stomach contents. Um, but yeah, that they. I, yeah, so I, I don't think there's any direct evidence at this stage. Um, but look, you know, those Limusaurus specimens still remain to be fully described, so it's possible that one or more of them does have stomach contents, and therefore that will shed some light on it. So you mentioned that this is kind of a, a widespread, in terms of its geographic distribution, group of dinosaurs. Where else are these animals found? So Elaphrosaurus itself is from eastern Africa, Tanzania. Uh, Limiosaurus is from China. Our Victorian specimen, obviously, is from Australia. And then Huinculsaurus, the latest known Elaphrosaur, is from Argentina. Uh, and even though, you know, the Argentine... African and Australian records each only constitute one specimen, um, they at least expand the range massively. And so I would say we should be expecting to find them in North America, in Europe, um, and there seem to be possible specimens from Europe as well, which um, which are as yet unpublished. Uh, and there have been reports of Elaphrosaurus from North America, but 
none of them have stood up to scrutiny. So it's almost, it's almost certainly just a matter of time to find these relatively rare dinosaurs in any given sedimentary sequence from late Jurassic to early Cretaceous. Hmm. Are they all kind of found in the same sort of facies, uh, occupying the same habitat, this kind of fluvial river system type environment? No, def- well, definitely not. Um, Elaphrosaurus, uh, as far as I'm aware, the Tendaguru site that it came from is sort of you know on the border of an estuary, so they're they're not far from the coast really. Um, whereas uh, Huinculsaurus is from well inland, um, and I don't think it's you know typically riverine sediments that it's deposited near or in. Uh, and then Limusaurus, as far as I remember is from a series of deposits which represents, you know, it's maybe the most similar environment to what we find in Victoria, so it's densely forested. But these animals were often um, getting trapped within much you know, footprints from much larger dinosaurs that became these big bogs. And um, so then these Limusaurus individuals would get bogged in them and, and die en masse. Wow. So, and, and that's sorry. That's that actually brings me to something I missed before, which is that for whatever reason, Victoria did not have any sauropod dinosaurs in the Cretaceous. So, yeah, it might have been just too cold for them, um, or they didn't have the right plants. That that seems less likely because this, the plants seem no different from environments in Australia that do have them. Um, but yeah, so these elaphrosaurs were living in the absence of sauropods uh, in Victoria. Yeah, that's what I was about to ask you. You you are a, a sauropod guy. I was looking at your at your CV and you've published a lot on sauropods. So I was going to ask you what other what other dinosaurs were living with this Victorian elaphrosaur and we already talked about kind of the other vertebrates that were around but um, mm-hmm. no big sauropods. No, no big sauropods at all. Um, which, yeah, again, it's, it's really odd that we've not found even a single tooth of them in the whole of the Victorian Cretaceous. Um, they almost certainly must have used Victoria as a thoroughfare at some point. We know that in the late Cretaceous, at least, sauropods were in Antarctica. Sauropods were in New Zealand. Um, if we had the right rocks, we'd find them at the end of the Cretaceous in Australia as well, but we just don't have those rocks, it would seem. Um, and so, yeah, they, they must have been able to get through into Australia at some point, but they weren't in Victoria you know, between about 125 and 105 million years ago. Uh, and it seems that you know, the, the really high polar uh, latitude and possibly cool temperatures, not, not freezing cold most of the time, but still cool enough, might have kept them away. Mm-hmm. Well, this kind of brings up a, a hot topic, no pun intended, in, in, in paleontology. <laughs> Sean's shaking his head. <laughs> I just um, can't figure out how this guy likes puns so much. I, I don't like puns. I just know they irritate the hell out of you, so that's why I use them so much. <laughs> Um, is this debate about about dinosaur endothermy or ectothermy or mesothermy? So, do you think the absence of sauropods at these lower latitudes might have something to do with that, to, with their biology? I know the um, the illustration you have of this this elaphrosaurus it has proto feathers on it. So, um, mm. <laughs> can controversial you, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, I mean, there's no evidence that any sauropod anywhere had anything but scaly skin. Um, and so they would have had no real natural insulation um, unless they had massive fat reserves, which, you know, with, compared with most real, modern reptiles, doesn't seem very likely. Um, so I don't think, uh, I think that it could well have been just a, a physiological barrier to them. If the temperatures down here in Victoria were too cold for them, they would have, you know, live somewhere where it was much easier to retain um, body warmth. As far as whether or not a Laphrosaurus had uh, any sort of feathery covering, there's absolutely no evidence at this point for what they were covered in. If you went by other Ceratosaurs, uh, I think, again, the evidence for them is really thin on the ground. We have Carnotaurus, which has scaly skin, and so that's sort of been taken as the norm for Ceratosaurs generally, but there's no actual way to demonstrate that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And um, if you follow the lines of, um, of some researchers, it's possible that, the, you know, in some kind of feathery or at least fuzzy integument might be right near the base of Ornithodira, which is the group that includes dinosaurs and pterosaurs. And so they might sort of have a, a common ancestry to have at least a predisposition to have this sort of feathery integument. But then once these dinosaurs reach a certain size, they just, you know, they move back to scaly mm-hmm. skin. It seems to have been shown with um, 
with tyrannosaurs in particular, we have Utyrannus from China, which has a feathery covering on it. But then most of the evidence for um, skin in North American tyrannosaurs is that it's, it's scaly skin. Um, and so it could be a size controlled thing, just like you know, modern day elephants have mm-hmm. bare skin for the most part, uh, whereas the youngsters have a bit more body hair. Um, might have just been that sort of thing that was was happening with ceratosaurs and so maybe our elaphrosaur had some kind of feathery integument but certainly not the full uh quill-like panaceous feathers that we would see on the coelurosaurian theropods mm-hmm. that's for sure yeah they would have been beneficial for them at those low latitudes for sure but mm. yeah it's it's Definitely. funny it's funny how the whole argument has evolved we've talked about this a couple of times on our shows and i remember uh back in the early 2000s one of the first conferences i went to there was a huge debate um there are basically two presenters one on the side of of whether or not dinosaurs were were feathered or have so, had some kind of proto feather covering and uh another side that was that was strongly against that idea and debating that all mm. dinosaurs just were scaly and so mm. um yeah <laughs> nowhere to nowhere to defend that point of view now <laughs> no no definitely not no the the, the chinese have have done away with that um mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I saw that picture and, and I was kind of laughing about it because it seems like every every illustration you see of theropods that come out nowadays, there's some sort of covering on them. You know, the the mohawk mm. on T Rex and <laughs> and the sunglasses. Well, on yeah, <laughs> like, always on that, a skateboard. That, that, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, that reconstruction was done by Rory Duncan, who I mentioned before, who's just studying ornithopods, and um, yeah, we we did discuss what to cover it in. And I think he'd seen a, a reconstruction of Huincolosaurus that someone had done and they'd put feathers on it. So he's like, well, that, that looks good to me. And it makes sense for it to have some kind of insulation given how far south it was living and, and you know, how it would have had to live with darkness and possible cool temperatures. So, yeah, look, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to, to think that Elaphrosaurs might have had some kind of covering because, like, most, if not all, theropods, they would have, pro- would have probably had a, a an endothermic um, physiology. It would have been warm-blooded for you know in latest mm-hmm. terms. Yeah. So is that kind of on the top of your list of things to do once uh, once the the uh, the COVID thing stops to get back down there and do some more poking around? Or oh, it'd be um, it'd be very cold at this time of the year on the Victorian coast and in short days, nowhere near as short as the Lafrasso was experiencing itself. But yeah, um, we did try and do a brief dig in. Oh, I think it was like yeah, the shortest day, like June twenty second last year, and that did not go miserable. Well. Um, yeah, right yeah. on the ocean too. <laughs> um, so I think we'd probably wait um, until Feb next year, perhaps. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit earlier, but uh, that'll be at the call of um, Tom Rich and Pat Vickers Rich, who are still very active here in the in the Victorian Cretaceous. And you work in South America, right? Or you? you uh, have? I've been, yeah, I've I've, I've visited uh, collections in South America three or four times. Um, haven't ever done any proper field work over there, but would absolutely love to, given half a chance. Um, because yeah, some of the fossils that I've been able to study over there have just been spectacular, and it's so funny that you know, I think I was actually shown the specimen that was eventually named Huincolosaurus mm. when I visited the institution it was housed in. I was like, oh, I'm here to see the ornithopods. I'm not, I'm not looking at the theropods right now. So I didn't really take the chance yeah. I had. I think um, that, that, glance, that, now. that glance you yeah. got must have been the thing that saw you, you recognized yeah. it. Yeah, it was in the, fate. In your subconscious. <laughs> well, we're going to talk more about Australian dinosaurs. When we come back, we're going to take another quick break. Science Nights in the morning here. We'll see you in a second. All right, everybody, we are back with the Science Night special guest today, Dr. Stephen Porapat. And uh, I have a quick uh, question here for you, uh, Stephen. And, yep. uh, it, you know, growing up as a, as a young kid, I'll never forget that first dinosaur toy I got. Man, I loved it. You're talking Stegosaurus. <laughs> you got the Triceratops. You got the Tyrannosaurus Rex. That just blew my mind. It blew my mind. And then I was a, a dinosaur nut ever since. Now, you have uh, uh, put yourself in a position to where now that's all you do. That is your, mm-hmm. the, like, life is your toy, right? Life is your toy chest. It's, so Yeah. 
So looking back, uh, when you were younger, what really inspired you? What made you real? Was there a show? Thomas and I both saw the same movie with uh, Fred, Fred Savage. Yeah, it wasn't Jurassic Park. It was before that. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it was uh, I can't. It, it was called Dinosaur. I think what so. It was called. Yeah, yeah. A little yeah, '80s movie. I've seen that one. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, All right. Wow. He's a part of the club. Yeah. Super fan. Claymation, I think it was. Yeah. yeah, it had claymation. Can you sing the Mesozoic yeah. Mind song? <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, for your for your listeners' benefit, I won't. But. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But but what what really kind of got you into just pushing all your chips into the dinosaur pot here? Oh look, it, it probably really started with um, a a kids book that I was given by a couple of you know fr- family friends who live two doors down from us. They just gave me a book on dinosaurs, and I was fascinated. Uh, I still have the book today. It's sitting in my parents' house, um, and you know, it's you look at it now. It's like it's nothing special. It's just something that was probably you know published for money and nothing more but it was still just fascinating to me and and i got familiar with all the famous dinosaurs like tyrannosaurus and triceratops but my favorites ever since i was a kid have been the sauropods and um i i was re-watching it because it came up on netflix the other day land before time (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) little foot being a little brontosaurus or a patasaurus or whatever you want to call him was just yeah it was it was the thing that I loved most in the world. And so, yeah, I had so many sauropod toys among all my other dinosaur toys. Um, but probably the other things that really just, I don't know, galvanized it were books from my grandma in particular. Um, she gave me a book that Mike Benton had written called The Pocket Book of Dinosaurs. And I've still got that as well, but it's barely usable. It's been right. so heavily put in my pocket and, and wherever else <laughs> yeah. that uh, it's just tattered and frayed. The cover's gone. It's, yeah, it's an absolute mess. But it was, you know, an alphabetical guide of dinosaurs. So I got to know all sorts of types that you, know, you wouldn't in a, net, in a general kid's book. But, yeah, showed me just how much we knew and how much we were yet to know. And so, yeah, I, I wanted to go down that track somehow and um, found a way to do so through Monash University and, and now through Swinburne University. Oh, man, that's great. And just the fact that you brought up line bef- Land Before Time, I'm like yeah. weeping. <laughs> I'm weeping right now on Is the inside. Is that the one where they find the uh, brontosaur or whatever in like the Congo and then it gets killed and it's real sad? Mm. What am I thinking of? Uh, that's that's bringing up Baby, I think. No, hang on, no. Yeah, that's Baby. Oh. That's Baby. No, Legend just called Lost Baby. Yeah. Legend of the Lost World. That one scarred yeah. me, man. I, I watched that when I was a kid. I love dinosaurs, and that, that they get they get blown away in that thing, man. It's it's pretty scary. Yeah, the Land Before, Before Time is, is pretty sad. sad. Is, it, is that yeah. the cartoon? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. It's cartoon. Yeah, yeah. and oh, that dude. is super it's sad heavy. too. That's heavy. right. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Back when they back when they made children's <laughs> movies that were that were <laughs> heavy <had> death. <laughs> yeah, they had death <laughs> and stuff. In them. Exactly. Yeah. Let's traumatize these kids early. But the other, I realized the other day, um. That, there was another one that was it was a Christopher Reeve uh, narrated documentary on dinosaurs, which was awesome. I remember that. Yeah, um, I remember that. Uh, the, Superman at the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because they had um, oh, what was his name? Phil Tippett. He was responsible for you know some of the animation on Jurassic Park and that sort of thing, but he did this absolutely awesome like ten minute sequence of this centrosaur being trapped through a forest by a tyrannosaur and then getting attacked and it was just stunning there was a um, raptor sequence thing. yes yes there was i, wow. I, I remember, remember i think we must be about the same age Stephen, because i i'm remembering all this but it's, it's kind of super far back in my mind i remember seeing a uh, something in the 80s th- th- i was i was convinced that dinosaurs were still around because it was so good, <laughs> oh, like yeah. the, it was, oh, like, and it was you know some terrible special effects. But maybe what you're talking about, because if they, you know, if it's like Star Wars level special effects, like stop motion animation, mm-hmm. I was full, I was like, Dad, I thought you said they're all extinct. There, there's one on the TV. They're, they're still around. <laughs> they're, they're real. <laughs> and he's like, No, this is garbage special effects. Son. Yeah. Are you talking about that uh, American sitcom that was basically Roseanne, but they were oh, all dinosaurs? Yeah. <laughs> it all sounds like we're like we're been. we're pre Jurassic Park I'm just nerds though. <laughs> Yeah, pretty, yeah, Alfred, yeah, I like that. But. So, what, what's your favorite, Stephen? If you had to choose, My favorite or oh, favorite dinosaur? It's always been a Patasaurus or Brontosaurus, as I wanted to call it, I and mean, couldn't for many, many years because you know it was invalid for until like 2015. Um, but yeah, sauropods have always been the best, and a Patasaurus just yeah of all of them was the one that just drew me in. Yeah, um, first one you pull so, out of the bucket of dinosaurs, typically. Mm, yep. Yeah. <laughs> 
But it also just it looks so cool, and it's so much chunkier and, and sort of um, able to able to defend itself than something like Diplodocus, which is so long and narrow and sort of gangly compared to it. Uh, maybe I identify more with a Apatos- because of my own body shape. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've never done this. We got to go around the horn here. What are your favorite dinosaurs, guys? Okay, Conley, you can go first. I think for... I know what. Tom oh says. man, well, oh, I don't know, dude. That's I like Ankylosaurus because uh-huh. it reminds me of like a Toyota Tercel or like a Toyota Corolla. <laughs> yeah, you know, you remember whenever you look at those books, it shows like the scale size. Yeah, right. And compares to like stuff modern day. Mm-hmm. Every time I think or I pick up a horny toad, the horny toads are all over the place. Uh, mm-hmm. Texas horn lizard, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they're all over the place, and I have to watch out for them whenever I'm mowing the lawn. <laughs> And uh, whenever I pick one up to save his little life, you know, uh, he just reminds me of that Ankylosaurus, man. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, mm-hmm. that group of dinosaurs is the bane of my existence in the Big Bend. I, I am, I am <laughs> still puzzled as to why we have not found more of those things out here. Hmm. If you think of Ooh, something that so. that should be preserved, yeah. Yeah. it's these tanks of animals with this battery of of armor plates. Mm-hmm. But we find like an osteoderm, uh, an armor plate here and there. But we haven't found anything as incredible as like what they find up in Canada and, and other places mm-hmm. in North America. They probably just weren't very abundant, but I like them too. They're pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're definitely my favorite. So uh, yours is also the ankylosaur. No, okay, we can move no, on. Then. No, no, no. <laughs> you know what my favorite is. <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, his is Tyrannosaurus Rex. That's right. It's it's so be, cliche. Yeah, it's awesome. Totally cliche. And I'm I whenever I was a kid I was uh saw that uh you know, Triceratops kicking Tyrannosaurus Rex's ass. So <laughs> You know, plunging those giant horns into his side and protecting itself. And I, there's a picture of me from uh, when I was about 10 years old in the Smithsonian next to a Triceratops fossil. And it's just, I, I love them. I think they're really cool. They look like some sort of a bull. Have you been to the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman? No, I've never been up there. They've got a exceptional triceratops it's display a, a full, yeah it shows the full, full ontogenetic thing. development oh, of the wow. animal yeah that's it's really cool. cool wow well how about you uh dr poor Pat? oh he already said oh yeah. wait oh yeah, yeah. yeah. okay yep yeah <laughs> yep sorry about that i think you yeah. were gonna ask <laughs> honor bond oh yeah <laughs> what, what is honor bond, bond? What, what's honor bond <laughs> the cows i wish you would enjoy let's give him the worst one what would it be what's the worst what's the worst dinosaur yeah like a hadrosaur or something well, yeah. well, we're going to have to think about that for a while, and maybe next week we'll go over what Honorbond's favorite dinosaur is, which is going to be the worst one. But in the meantime, <laughs> we're going to thank Stephen Porapat for being here. Yes. Thank you so much. You've been great, and I think you've really told everybody, illustrated how diverse dinosaurs really are worldwide. And I really appreciate well, you being here. Uh, thanks for being on the show, Science Nights in the Morning. We'll see you next time, everybody. Yep. Yeah.